Good morning. I hope you are finding these Easter meditations helpful. And uh, we come on today to, uh, I guess, the uh, climactic event, the most important event of human history. It is where the, the gate of salvation is thrown wide open and we come to the very focus of the hope of all mankind, and that is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have a look at a cry. We're going to focus on one uh, specific cry that he utters from the cross. There are uh, what we call seven words from the cross. This surely is the most profound of them all. This cry from the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, so profound that the greatest minds have wrestled with this all through the years. And yet they take us to the very heart and meaning of the cross, I believe. They're found in Matthew 27 and in verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think to a mere impartial observer, the, uh, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is an absolute enigma. For the person who's not a Christian, for the mere observer, the whole um, journey to the cross and the very act of uh, Jesus of Nazareth being crucified is a total mystery, maybe something that seems absolutely unnecessary. Why should such a good man be brutally executed in this way? Or if someone is to link God to it, they would say, well, surely there must be another way. Why on earth did Jesus Christ, if he's God's son, have to die? And so we're grappling today with the most terrible words that ever fell from the lips of Jesus of Nazareth. And yet, as I say, I do believe they provide the key to understanding why he actually came into the world and why this event took place, why he was actually dying on that day. These are strange times, and if you this morning should be grappling with this whole matter of social distancing or just finding isolation difficult, I hope that as we look at these words today and at this account in the Gospel of Matthew, that we'll just get our days in perspective. The words isolated, abandoned, uh, even forsaken are words that we could use over this event here and describe all that Christ experienced and much more. Now, I guess that if we're Christians, we may have um, theological slots for different parts of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and today we could um, neatly assign what's happening today under atonement. We could file that under atonement in, in our systematic doctrine. Or, or we could maybe uh, file it under penal substitution. We could have a good... A theological explanation for what's happening today. But still we have to just admit that we're grappling with things much too profound for us to ever understand. And uh, at the heart, why should he, why should this most wonderful person die to save a sinner just like me? It is incredible what we're dealing with today. I'm glad it's not just people like me struggling with these words. All through the years, uh, the giants of the church 
have been looking at this text and trying to really get to the depth and the meaning of it. It's said that uh, Martin Luther had taken this text to, to preach on and he was in his study and he was uh, preparing and uh, pondering um, these words, turning them over for hours on end. And every now and then someone would poke a head in and yet he would be motionless, uh, just lost in, in his thoughts. And uh, hours went by, more time went by, and it's said that after all this time, he simply threw his hands up in the air and he uttered these words, God forsaken by God, who can understand it? But let us consider uh, a, a greatly important aspect to this whole um, account, and that is the Saviour's loneliness. We need to grasp just the utter loneliness that he would have experienced at this time. He was betrayed by Judas. He was denied by Peter, his right-hand man, and then, as Giles brought out yesterday, he was forsaken by all his disciples. Uh, the sheep were scattered, uh, and he was totally alone, bereft of all those who loved him and followed him. On top of that, he was surrounded uh, by people who had long hated him and desired his death. Um, the only faces he sees before him are either distorted with, with anger and rage and hostility, or, or simply are a picture of cruel delight and pitiless mockery. He is totally isolated. Maybe you and I, in our isolation, we enjoy a few comforts still, hopefully. But when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ here, he enjoys no comfort, uh, no display of warmth. We saw how even in Gethsemane he's longing for human comfort, for human company. But here he is totally isolated, totally cut off. No warmth, no fond looks, no, no love, no pity. Instead, a, a crown of, of long, sharp thorns are pressed down on his head. Um, he's clubbed and then pushed from one person to another as if he were a rag doll. Then he's flogged by a leather whip that has sharp bone that rakes deep down into his flesh. So even his bone is exposed. And again, any neutral observer should ask why? Why such hostility towards this man? Um, he must have been a very wicked man to have this done to him. But no, this is the wonderful, spotless, sinless Son of God. If ever a human being lived a good life, it was him spotless, sinless, harmless. Amazingly, when we see the Lord Jesus Christ hung up on the cross, this public display of shame, um, there isn't one word of complaint from this man as he dies in agony. Many words of compassion says, or rather prays to his father over those who are mocking him, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. So he utters many words of compassion, but not one word of complaint or protest. There is a deep conviction that he must do this. He has to go through with this. He, he's, he's wrestled in Gethsemane, Lord, if it's your will, Father, can you take this from me? But if not, your will be done. So he's on this mission. He's been all through the years aware this is the mission. Now this is the 
climax, which really takes us to those words in verse 46 again. Um, prophetic words. Um, over 2,000 years ago, uh, David, he um, utters um, these words prophetically in Psalm 22. Uh, about the ninth hour, Jesus cries out in a loud voice. But maybe we can just back up a little bit because um, this climactic moment, this, this moment, the whole of mankind is absolutely dependent upon for forgiveness, for everlasting life. There is no other hope. This must succeed. And, and maybe just back up a verse before I read those, those words again. Because it's significant what happens and just before he utters this cry. In verse 45, we read, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. So, an eerie darkness falls upon this scene. Uh, we read of the, the plagues in Egypt. One of the plagues was darkness. It was a darkness that could be felt. There was a heaviness. It wasn't just darkness. It was a heaviness and an absolute total blackness. A, a total eclipse, yes, but no ordinary eclipse. It lasts for three hours. Three hours of eerie darkness. All nature mourns, it would seem as if there's a, a, a cloak thrown over this awful scene of desolation. And so then we have that cry in verse 46, that, that cry of dereliction. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. Reading through that, where do we put the emphasis? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where do we put the emphasis? We're just grappling here with, uh, with, with something of the cry of anguish. But we are taken to the very heart of God's atoning work for our sin. There's been preparation for this all through the scripture, all the way through the Old Testament. We are shown the sacrificial lamb, that if there is to be any forgiveness for sin, a lamb without blemish has to be sacrificed. Um, it is a substitute. Um, it is, it is a, a creature being offered for the guilty, something that is pure, and unblemished, being offered up to God, its life taken so that the guilty might be pardoned. There is no other way that uh, sin can be forgiven apart from the Lamb and its blood being shed. The Apostle Paul put this tremendous work of substitution, this sacrificial death, in a nutshell in 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 21, he explains, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange, as some have called it. So Christ at this very point at the very heart of this act, is being made sin for us. In, the, in other words, that the pure and holy one is being cloaked with, with our sin. Um, he's being overwhelmed. There, there is a tsunami of sin being placed on him. Uh, the sin of mankind is beyond our comprehension. Um, our sin, he's taking the rap. For, for our wrong, for the filth and the vileness of human sin. It's as if he were becoming um, a, a liar, a thief, a murderer, an abuser, 
Um, you think of the most vile sins. They're being placed on him, on his holy soul. And so at this very moment, because God can have no fellowship with sin, as one of the hymns puts it, the Father turns his face away. There has never been a separation before between the Father and the Son from all eternity. They have delighted in each other. The Father has loved the Son and the Son has loved the Father and together with the Holy Spirit, this glorious unity, this trinity, have dwelt in love and fellowship. But at this very point, there is separation. And the Father who is face to face, the Son who is face to face, they, they are separated. And, and, and me grappling with this, did the Lord Jesus not know it was going to come to this? Is there not an element of surprise here? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lord, others have forsaken me. But why have you forsaken me? Were you not going to be with me through this? But it was for us. We have to grasp and uh, relish in the things that we do know. It was for us he died. It was for the guilty. It was for the, for the vilest offender. We, we sang years ago for the vilest offender who truly believes that moment a pardon for Jesus receives. Maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking, there's no hope for me. If only you knew my sin. If only you knew what I've done, what I've thought, what I've said. Oh, dear friend, today, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, washes from all sin, any sin, every sin, for those who repent and, and as it were, put their hand upon the sacrificial lamb, as they did in the Old Testament. They said, Lord, it's for me. This is, this is, this is me. He's dying for me. There was that personal uh, appropriation of this sacrifice. We, we take him to be our own sacrifice, my sacrifice. And dear saint here today, you who are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and yet aware of all your failure, oh boy, don't we feel the guilt of our sin at times. We know what it's like to feel guilty. But for the Christian, all our sin has been laid on him. There is no condemnation for those who are trusting in Christ Jesus. They're washed away, they're taken away, they are removed, they're thrown to the depths of the sea as far as the east is from the west. So far has our transgressions been removed from us. Because of this, the equivalent of all our sin being placed on him, he is taking that, whatever that means. And again, we're grappling with things that we are just unable to really understand but oh should not gratitude flow from our hearts at this moment we're showing our appreciation for those NHS heroes uh, and we're standing outside our homes each week clapping banging plates applauding because we're so grateful we're so thankful because we we recognize sacrifice when we see it we're thankful for those who are risking their lives, some laying down their lives. Past generations have shown such gratitude for sacrifice. Uh, Winston Churchill, in, in those uh, crisis war years of World War II, he was speaking of those brave pilots who risked their lives. Uh, and those famous words, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. I won't attempt the voice. But the greater truth is, never was so much owed by so many to one man. This is the ultimate sacrifice. This is God the Son dying on the cross for our sin, 
being separated from his father, totally isolated, totally abandoned because he bore our sin. Let me just finish with this lovely verse. The Apostle Peter, the one who denied Christ so dreadfully and, and wept so bitterly, this eyewitness of the cross, he, he later writes as an old man, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So two things that flow from that verse and from this wonderful act. Firstly, that we are to hate sin and love righteousness. If sin should do this, if my sin should do this to this beautiful Saviour, should I not hate the sin that caused him such pain? And should I not love righteousness? And as Peter puts it, we must die to sins and live for righteousness in all that we say and do. And then secondly, that we're to rest in the fact that because we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never be forsaken. You will never be abandoned by God. And that's why the Lord Jesus was able to say, never will I forsake you. <laughs> He's been forsaken. So that he might say, never will I forsake you. Let's pray now. Father, we bow before you, totally mystified in one sense by why you should have to do this thing to your son. And yet, Lord, we, we know there was no other way for our sin to be dealt with and for you, Lord, to punish in full the wrong that we have done. We simply bow down before you and we worship you, Lord, for those things that we do not understand. 